Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining BioTissue's webinar on biological advances in treating ocular surface inflammation. My name is Corlette DeVoe. I'm Senior Director of Marketing at BioTissue. It is my pleasure to introduce to you tonight our distinguished and esteemed panel of speakers. First up is Dr. Chris Rapuano. Dr. Rapuano joined the Cornea Service at Wills Eye Institute after his fellowship in 1991. Dr. Rapuano is a nationally and internationally recognized expert in corneal diseases with a special interest in refractive surgery. He has published several books and over 100 research papers in the medical literature on corneal diseases and eczema laser PTK surgery. During his ophthalmology residency, Dr. Rapuano co-authored a best selling textbook in ophthalmology, the Wills Eye Institute Manual. Dr. Rapuano serves on many committees of the American Academy of Ophthalmology and on the editorial boards of numerous peer-reviewed ophthalmology journals, including the American Journal of Ophthalmology. Our second speaker this evening is Dr. Neil Desai. Dr. Desai specializes in LASIK, cataract, and corneal diseases of the eye and currently practices at Eye Institute of West Florida. Dr. Desai completed his fellowship at the Wilmer Eye Institute at Johns Hopkins University. He is recognized throughout the country and internationally as one of, the, of only 100 surgeons able to perform advanced corneal transplant plans and other complex cataract, corneal, and refractive procedures. He holds pending patents to new surgical products and advanced corneal surgical procedures of its own design. Additionally, Dr. Desai has authored many book chapters in his field of study and continues to write articles in peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Desai is also the medical director of an international site restoration eye bank and is on the editorial board of iWorld. Please join me in welcoming our speakers, Dr. Chris Rapuano, and Dr. Neil Desai. Okay, I guess that's my cue. This is uh, Dr. Christopher Rapuano, and I'm gonna start with talking about corneal inflammation and healing, especially in relation to amniotic membrane tissue and specifically the prokara. So we're talking about corneal healing. We start off with ocular surface inflammation. And inflammation is the first sign of wound healing, so in that way, it's a very good thing, but it's also the hallmark of many ocular surface diseases. In fact, over the past maybe 10, 15 years, dry eye syndrome is now thought to at least be in part or in many parts an inflammatory condition. Uncontrolled inflammation, however, leads to pain, delayed healing, tissue damage, and if it's uncontrolled healing in the cornea, can cause corneal scarring and occasionally perforation. So when we see corneal healing, corneal inflammation, you know, in some ways we want to kind of acknowledge that and know that there's corneal healing going on, but if it's uncontrolled, we need to control it to promote good normal healing. So non-resolved inflammation leads to tissue damage and it needs to be controlled to modulate good corneal or ocular wound healing. So there's kind of this cascade or this timeline of healing. There's inflammation, and in a lot of parts of the body, including the eye, there's granulation tissue, and then there's wound contraction, i.e. scarring that goes on after that. So the inflammation comes on first, and we want to modulate that to decrease the amount of scar tissue and get optimal healing. So really two kind of pathways that we can think of. One is a passive path pathway where there's tissue injury and there's uncontrolled inflammation and you get a, bit, a little bit of a vicious cycle where there's more tissue damage, poor healing, you get ulceration, and if that doesn't get controlled, there's perforation, and if it does begin to heal eventually, you get scar formation, and if it's in the cornea, you end up with visual loss either way. On the other hand, you can have an active pathway where you control the inflammation in one way or another, which we'll talk about, 
improve and get proper healing and ideally get exact replacement of tissue, ideally get smooth, clear corneal tissue when there's corneal damage and corneal regeneration. So that's the pathway we'd like to see go on. And the idea, one of the ideas many years ago behind amniotic membrane tissue was this concept of scarless fetal wound healing. The idea was that when there are wounds in the fetus, um, they can often be taken care of with minimal scarring. So, and in, in that way, there, there reduces inflammation and promotes healing. So you get this concept, you want to reduce inflammation and promote healing. That's the dual action of amniotic membrane tissue, which we'll begin to talk about. So amniotic membrane in utero has certain aspects, and then on the ocular surface has very similar aspects, uh, which is one of the great things about it. In utero, it acts as a physical barrier against the external environment, and on the ocular surface, it does the same thing. It actually protects the ocular surface from the outside world. It acts as an anti-scarring agent in utero, and the same on the ocular surface. It acts as an anti-inflammatory agent in utero, and the same on the ocular surface. It's an anti-antigenic agent in utero, and the same on the ocular surface, and it supports epithelial adhesion, differentiation, and healing in utero, and also on the ocular surface. So there's a, the, the current treatment paradigm, at least as many doctors kind of follow it, is a passive kind of single action therapy where we treat the underlying pathology. So for example, if there's an infection, you treat the infection, maybe address the inflammation, and kind of wait to see what happens and hope for the best. What we're going to talk about today is kind of this active dual action therapy where we're using amniotic membrane to both control inflammation and promote healing. So of course you want to treat the underlying pathology, whether it's infection or autoimmune melting, and you control inflammation and prevent further damage and then promote regenerative healing. So AMT, amniotic membrane, will help control inflammation and promote regenerative healing. And that's the idea behind it. So what are the passive ways to do this? Well, you can use contact lenses or, or goggles or bandage lenses, which does have some protection, but it's a very passive wound healing. Steroids can work to decrease inflammation, but in some ways, or in often ways, it will delay wound healing. Non-steroidals will delay wound healing, if not cause further melting. Topical antibiotics, Obviously important if there's an infection, but can in and of themselves delay healing, and certainly they're toxic in many ways and can delay healing too. Tetracyclines, omega-3s, um, lid scrubs are certainly beneficial for certain things, but they don't really do very much for wound healing. Now, Procara. Procara is an amniotic membrane which is attached to a thin polycarbonate ring that then sits on the eyes. You place this ring in basically like a big contact lens, and the amniotic membrane then sits on the ocular surface covering the entire cornea and the limbus to both decrease inflammation and promote healing. And the idea is that amniotic membrane promotes this scarless wound healing that we saw in utero, and also it acts as a bandage to help with pain relief reduce corneal haze, and in the end, ideally, improve vision. So specifically, let's talk about corneal inflammation. This is just from Medicare data a couple years ago, talking about uh, reasons for corneal, for, for exams, Medi Medicare exams on, for corneal inflammation, superficial injury to the cornea, SBK, infections, filamentary keratitis, these are common conditions that involve corneal inflammation. So where do I see amniotic membrane, and specifically Procara, kind of coming into my personal clinical practice? Um, well, I've kind of divided up into mild, moderate severity on this page, and then next, kind of more severe patients. I see a lot of patients with infectious keratitis. Um, Needless to say, you need to treat the infection and get the infection under control. But frequently, 
Once the infection is under control, the epithelium is having a hard time healing, whether it's because of toxicity from medications, at which point we'll start to decrease the, the toxic antibiotics, but a lot of times there's just poor ocular surface from the infection and from the kind of chronic antibiotics they've used for days and days or weeks and weeks, and there's also moderate stromal inflammation. And sometimes we use steroids at this point, the SCUT study didn't show steroids having a real significant effect in infectious keratitis, but I'm using AMT in the form of Procarat in a lot of these patients, which oftentimes over a week or two will significantly help the epithelium to heal. I continue the antibiotics, put the Procarat in, and literally within a week or two, the epithelial defect is much better, if not completely resolved. So the the kind of chronic uh, epithelial healing problems in patients with infectious keratitis that's being treated is, I think, an excellent use of Procara. The other use, whether it's a Procara or a glued or sutured AMT, are the postoperative, what I call the vulnerable corneas. Um, whether it's corneal transplants, PKs, or DALKs in eyes with poor ocular surfaces, Procara uh, will significantly help with the healing. And EDTA chelation, which are often done in sick eyes, in patients with band keratopathy, where we just think the epithelium is going to have a hard time healing. Uh, and ED, uh, uh, Procara after an EDTA chelation can be very helpful in getting those eyes to heal. A lot of times those eyes have a history of herpes simplex or herpes zoster, which have a hard time healing anyway, or even diabetic uh, neurotrophic corneas, which have a hard time healing, a Procara can be very helpful in those eyes. And similarly, superficial keratectomies or PTK in poor seeing eyes, more worried about prolonged reepithelization, a Procara can be extremely helpful in those patients. And then secondly, in what I call the severe patients, some have neurotrophic keratitis, patients with poorly healing epithelium, um, which just haven't responded to conservative measures such as frequent ointments. I may try a bandage lens, or I may even use a Procara before a bandage lens um, in a lot of these patients. And I'll often use this before doing a permanent or temporary lateral tarsorophy because it's very easy and fairly comfortable for patients and much better tolerated than a, uh, than a temporary tarsorophy. And then lastly, the corneal melts. Um, if there's significant tissue loss, a Procara can be very helpful just in protecting the surface, um, decreasing ex exposure, and getting that epithelium to heal. Um, chemical burn, Stevens-Johnson patients, whether it's a Procara, I think ideally you do a sutured or glued AMT. It's probably a better option. However, sometimes you just can't bring a patient to the operating room to do that, and a Procara can be very helpful. So my own personal treatment protocol in my office if I see a patient where I feel this may be beneficial, I'll check with the, my billing department, make sure that their patient's insurance will cover the Procara. I discuss the procedure, get informed consent from the patient, give anesthetic drops, and then take the Procara out, rinse it off with saline, and then place it right in the eye. Um, it's a pretty rapid process. It doesn't take me long in the office to do at all. I tend to continue the medications, and then depending on how much – exposure they've got, I may apply a temporary kind of tape tarsorophy. Um, often I'll, I'll either tape the eyes closed or um, maybe use the Breathe Right nasal strips to take the temporal half of the eyes closed. I find that the Procara AMT lasts longer if, if the eye doesn't stay open very much. So my initial expectations are the patient will have kind of this full feeling um, in the orbit, but they usually don't have much pain. I wouldn't say it's very comfortable, um, but they don't usually complain of pain. I expect the Procara to stay in. I don't think I've ever had one pop out on me. I see them within a week. You have to remember there is a 10-day global period. The amniotic membrane tends to last one to two weeks, occasionally shorter, occasionally longer. I had a patient recently where it lasted six weeks, although that is not common. Once the amniotic membrane is dissolved, then I just pop the Procara out of the eye very, very easily and painlessly. I expect the epithelial defect to have improved or ideally have resolved, that the stromal inflammation is better. If the patient's improving, but let's say the epi defect went from 8 millimeters to 4 millimeters, I might put another Procara in there for another couple weeks 
to get the last four millimeter epithelial defect to heal. My general approach is to have a Procara available in the office. I have a, a freezer that's basically specially for the Procara. Um, make sure my billing department knows about these billing issues. Is a pre-cert needed? And if no, how do we get the pre-cert? So I'm going to go through a couple of cases, um, I think about five cases, just to kind of illustrate different uses um, that I find very helpful with the Procara. The first case is actually a case of Schaefer Tseng's. Um, this is a patient, the history of LASIK, contact, uh, and, and, uh, and contact lenses and had a significant corneal ulcer. Um, this was scraped, started on fortified, it grew out staph aureus and was placed on fortified antibiotics. As the antibiotics were being tapered, there was still significant inflammation and a persistent epithelial defect. Once the infection was getting better and the epi defect was not getting better, a Procara was placed, and two weeks later, significantly reduced inflammation, the epithelial defect has, had healed, and the patient regained excellent vision. So that, to me, is a, is a great use of a Procara. It's easy to do, fast, right in the office. This is a patient of mine, uh, history of HSV stromal keratitis, long history of stromal keratitis, and then a month before uh, this photo was taken, he was diagnosed with a new HSV dendrite, which was topical and increased his oral antivirals. The active dendrite resolved, but his epithelial defect persisted. I stopped the topical antivirus, used frequent ointment, used a bandage lens. None of that helped. But then I placed a Procara, and within two weeks, the epithelial defect had completely healed. This is the patient at the time. You can see there's, it's, there's significant thinning um, centrally there. This is a, another patient of mine, 62-year-old gentleman with a neurotrophic keratitis after a brain tumor surgery. Um, he did well for several years with a permanent lateral tarsorophy, uh, but for some reason recently developed a central epithelial defect that was just not responding to increased ointments or bandage lens. So Procara was placed and 10 days later, I removed the Procara uh, because the AMT had, re had dissolved. And here, there's no epithelial defect. And you know, there's, there is thinning, um, much less inflammation, and no epi defect. And he's done well now with just continued ointments. And this is a patient who was under, uh, undergo had a failed graft, was undergoing a repeat PK. He had poor healing after his first PK. You can see he's got a, a lateral tarsorophy here or uh, nasal tarsorophy here, rather, after his first graft. So after the regraft was done, it actually placed the Procara, I think, post-op day one, and then kept it in for several weeks. This is actually the gentleman that it lasted six weeks after surgery, and then when it finally came off, the epithelial surface was beautifully, beautifully healed, and he's done quite nicely. And then lastly, this is a 75-year-old gentleman who, who had actually three DSEC surgeries done at another institution who now had a stromal melt. And this is not responding to frequent ointments, bandage lens, temporary tarsorophy. In fact, it's quite interesting. In the lower picture, his own cornea, the anterior cornea, had almost completely melted away, and the only thing that's keeping it from perfing is the DSEC behind that. So place the Procara. And there it is in there. And within two weeks, the epithelial defect had completely healed and, in, and has remained healed, although his vision is not very great from significant irregular stigmatism, but it was the only thing that got his epithelial surface to heal. So in summary, amniotic membrane modulates healing towards regeneration, decreases inflammation, decreases scarring. The cryotech, uh, biotissues cryotech procedure kind of maintains what I call the goodies in the amniotic membrane. Um, Procara is FDA approved to treat ocular surface inflammation um, and does an excellent job very quickly and nicely and efficiently in the office um, for in-office use. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Dr. Desai, and then we will take questions uh, with hopefully some answers at the end. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Raffalano. That was a, a great presentation on uh, the applications of Procara for corneal uh, inflammation. Um, I'm going to actually sort of shift the discussion now to a discussion of conjunctival inflammatory diseases and the use of this uh, cryopreserved amniotic membrane or amniograft uh, provided for us by biotissue. Um, my practice here in Florida um, is much like your practices uh, there at home, um, where we have a, it's just a diversity of pathology. Um, we now do laser refractive cataract surgery with patients, uh, up to about 60% of patients choosing some form of laser refractive cataract surgery. I treat ocular surface diseases from uh, basement membrane disorder all on up to Salzburg nodular. Um, all forms of dry eye syndrome, uh, as well as conjunctive ocholesis, which we'll talk about soon. Um, of course, chronic ulcers from infectious ulcers, autoimmune ulcers, and neurotrophic ulcers, uh, pterygia and other conjunctival lesions, corneal transplants, ultra-thin DSEC and DMEC, and uh, traditional PK, um, as well as a host of high-risk corneal transplant and corneal melt uh, circumstances. What all of these... Uh, various forms of pathology have in common uh, is simply put uh, a process of inflammation that we're all trying to battle. And um, in that uh, spirit, um, I've been in my relatively young career been fortunate to be first-hand witness to just a few game changers um, in our field and in our profession, from lamellar transplantation, endothelial transplantation, and now all of its various forms to the application of femtosecond lasers and LASIK um, and now even cataract surgery. This field of active biologics in the form of amniotic membranes and cryopreserved amniotic membranes, um, I would posit to you, is a tremendous game changer in how we treat ocular surface disease, um, most of which, as we increase our understanding of them, uh, are inflammatory at their, at their heart. Um, so Procara obviously has, as Dr. Rapuana discussed, allowed the immediate and efficient in-office treatment of ocular surface and corneal diseases from keratitis, neurotrophic ulcers, basement membrane disease, and post-surgical applications after transplant or collagen cross-linking. Um, and what's, what makes this a game changer is not only the application of this active biological Band-Aid, um, but the fact that we no longer need to wait to take the patient to the operating room in a few days or in a few weeks, we can treat at the point of diagnosis in clinic, and this is a game changer. Now, there are always going to be a few applications where we have to use um, amniograft um, and suture it to the cornea or the conjunctiva. Um, and amniograft, I was actually introduced to amniograft before I was introduced to Procara, um, and amniograft, as a reminder, is, is the first and still the only FDA-designated amniotic membrane for ocular surface wound repair and the indication of wound healing, unlike other forms of dehydrated amniotic membrane that no longer preserve the active uh, molecules that promote an anti-inflammatory effect, an anti-scarring effect, and anti-angiogenic actions. So, the indications for use, this is by no means a full list. In fact, the indications for use, um, being that amniograft is FDA designated for wound healing, we can use amniograft or Procara for that matter for any indication where we are both fighting inflammation, trying to promote healing, um, and prevent scarring and new vascularization. So the surgical indications, many of them are now being able to be treated in office by the Procara, the conjunctival lesions we're going to talk about in a moment, and then there are other ocular surface conditions that can either be treated by a combination of Procara and um, OR placement of amniograft um, for those severe cases. So let's focus on four different areas where I find myself now using amniograft in the operating room uh, mostly. All of the other indications that I used to use amniograft for are now being treated in office at the point of service, um, and that has been a, a boon for myself in terms of efficiency and practice management, but also for my patients, of course. So we're going to focus on uh, pterygia, 
conjunctive ocalasis, ocular surface neoplasia in its many different forms, and filamentary keratitis, uh, which is oftentimes associated with superior limbic keratitis. So we're going to go through a few cases here. Um, as I said earlier, I was first introduced to this platform technology in the context of Teresian surgery. Um, and during my training at, at Wilmer, we were mostly exposed to the dehydrated form of amniotic membrane. And quite frankly, uh, I think you'll find this compelling as I do, uh, Teresian surgery used to be my least favorite procedure to do uh, because I suffered with relatively high recurrence rates uh, some cases of poor cosmesis, post-operative pain, um, and prolonged recovery for patients, conjunctival scarring, and frankly the procedure just wasn't very fun because the dehydrated form of membrane um, being much like rice paper, it didn't have the intraoperative workability or resilience um, that the cryopreserved tissue has. When you look at sort of the evolution of surgical techniques over the last century, uh, for pterygia, starting with primary excision leaving just bare sclera, you can see that we've gone through quite an evolution of techniques with a successively uh, decreasing recurrence rate. Um, most patients or most uh, surgeons that I talk to that are not using amniotic membranes yet are doing conjunctival autographs, um, which still suffers uh, from a relatively higher recurrence rate in the printed literature. Um, but also suffers from the fact that we are inherently creating two wounds that now have to heal and that much more inflammation on the ocular surface. Um, but we're also sacrificing normal healthy conjunctiva, which for glaucoma patients may be an issue. Um, and certainly these patients are in significantly more uh, pain uh, as they do have two wounds to heal uh, now. So amniotic membrane grafts um, certainly in the literature have shown far less uh, recurrence rates. And in my own practice, since I started monitoring these things, um, in my first year of practice here in Florida in 2008, including uh, cases of recurrences uh, and including in that number cases where I had a postoperative granuloma or conjunctival scarring, um, included in these numbers. In 2008, I did 57 ocular surface cases using amniograft, both for trigia um, and a few other ocular surface uh, lesions. 15.8%, almost 16% uh, of these cases either suffered from recurrence or scarring or granuloma formation. And you can see in 2010, that number shifted dramatically for the better. Um, to the point where I had less than 2% um, out of 110 cases um, performed that year. The only thing that changed, I didn't miraculously become a, a better surgeon in 2010. The only thing that changed was I started using cryopreserved amniotic tissue or amniograph um, for my pterygium cases and other ocular surface cases. Um, and since that time, as my technique has slowly improved and I've picked up a few pearls um, shared by Schiffer Singh and my other colleagues around the country, um, that rate in 2012, um, from January 2012 to present, is now uh, 0%. I've had no recurrences, no cases of granuloma formation, and no cases of conjunctival uh, scarring. We have to understand um, the pathophysiology underlying pterygium formation before we really grasp why cryopreserved amniotic membrane in the form of uh, amniograft is so effective in such cases. We all know that pterygium uh, or pterygia are really just tissue injury from UV irradiation or solar elastosis of the substantia propria that is driven by an inflammatory process um, intimately involved with six identified matrix metalloproteases, number 1, 2, 3, 9, 14, and 15. Interestingly enough, it's matrix metalloprotease 2 that's intimately involved also in basement membrane disorders and the ability for pterygia to invade Bowman mem Bowman's membrane. There have also been some fairly recent reports of uh, P53 uh, tumor suppressor gene mutations in pterygia, which raises the specter of this multimodal um, and inflammatory uh, process. We also can understand that preoperative inflammation um, will not only exacerbate the growth 
of pterygia, but also increase the risk of recurrence. So we must control preoperative inflammation in all its different forms, including blepharitis, uh, whether that be from ocular surface rosacea, lid margin disease, or even demodex, which is uh, certainly underappreciated. And of course, our surgical technique, depending on how meticulous it is, may also induce inflammation inherently. Postoperative inflammation, the use of sutures, uh, is also a common uh, cause of inflammation and hence recurrence. And so our success rate with pterygium surgery and the success uh, and happiness of our patients is going to be dependent entirely on our ability to control both preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative inflammation. And this is really where the application of amniotic membranes is so potent. We really need to identify uh, how aggressive um, or how severe a trisium is as it is going to modify or change our surgical technique. And there are really two ways we can um, grade a pterygia through a validated approach. Um, number one, we can grade the severity uh, and visibility of episcleral blood vessels um, into a mild, moderate, and severe stage, as you see in these pictures along the right. Um, in a severe stage, you're going to see a very um, uh, beefy red and inflamed pterygia that is obviously raised. And also very instructive is to look at the caruncle morphology. When you start to see the caruncle dragged towards the limbus and flattened, um, this is indicative of a more severe pterygium that is going to be more prone to recurrence and should therefore inform our surgical approach. So again, we want to look at the presence and visibility of episcleral blood vessels as well as um, the morphology of the caruncle, as this has been shown to not only uh, be highly correlated to recurrence rate, but also uh, postoperative uh, diplopia. So again, the key points to achieve best outcomes with pterygium surgery is going to be to control preoperative inflammation, starting with the use of steroids or NSAIDs, treating underlying ocular surface diseases like dry eye, uh, blepharitis, MGD, demodex, ocular rosacea. And then with our surgical technique, follow a meticulous dissection along natural tissue planes um, to minimize bleeding and inflammation postoperatively. We want to certainly remove all the fibrovascular tissue and tenons, abnormal tenons, down to a bare sclera. We want to identify and avoid the violation of the rectus muscle sheaths. Um, and identify the gap that between normal tenons and conjunctiva from which the fibrovascular stalk extends and from where you're going to get uh, your recurrences. That gap we'll talk about uh, in detail in a little moment. We want to avoid excessive cautery as, as that uh, results in more inflammatory cell death um, and uh, which will increase your uh, likelihood of getting scleral thinning. Um, and poor wound healing as well as recurrence. And then we use uh, fibro, fibrin thrombin glue or tissue, uh for our sutureless surgery, again, minimizing any uh, sutures to avoid inflammation uh, postoperatively. We want to seal this gap um, between normal conjunctiva and normal tenons once we've excised all of the abnormal tenons and the pterygium itself. And then we use amnio graft uh, to cover this wound bed, uh, which will control our postoperative inflammation and provide for excellent cosmesis, comfort, and uh, prevention of recurrence. So to start out, we use topical anesthesia. I inject a um, lidocaine with epinephrine solution um, into the lesion itself and the surrounding areas uh, and use 2% lidocaine gel preoperatively. I place a traction suture at the uh, corneal uh, periphery at 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock. This traction um, will not only provide you excellent exposure, but it will also flatten out your rectus uh, muscle against the sclera, uh, against the globe, so as to help you identify tissue planes and avoid the muscle sheath. Um, you want to be careful about retaining enough residual normal healthy conjunctiva uh, if possible, as this will allow you to reconstruct the, the normal uh, semilunar fold and caruncle. We need to, though, remove all of the abnormal tenons, which tends to have a more gelatinous uh, 
uh, texture to it rather than the normal um, fibrous tissue of normal tenons. Uh, I don't always apply mitomycin in primary uh, mild pterygian cases, but in cases of uh, Hispanic African American patients that are more prone to having uh, more severe pterygia uh, as graded by the presence of episcleral vessels and uh, the change in caroncular morphology, uh, I will use mitomycin. And it's important to realize that we're not really treating the bed here. What we're treating with mitomycin is the root of the fibrovascular stock in that gap between the sub, uh, sub subconjunctival space between normal tenons and our normal conjunctiva. That is the area you want to treat with mitomycin to prevent recurrence. We want to seal that gap oftentimes with a running suture. Uh, you can use 10 nylon and what you're suturing together is the normal tenons, which will recess itself and fold over the normal conjunctiva to which you're suturing and recreate a very nice uh, normal anatomy for a semilunar fold there. With amniotic membrane, um, we can oftentimes use two layers of amniotic membrane, one layer glued down over the muscle itself and one layer to cover the entire wound bed. Um, this kind of dual layer closure will prevent muscle restriction and scarring and reduce your risk of having postoperative diplopia. It also changes uh, significantly the reimbursement and the coding for this. Um, so a, a dual layer closure is uh, significantly different. Um, so let's look at this gap. In between normal conjunctiva and tenons capsule is this root of the fibrovascular stalk, and this is what's most important um, in uh, preventing recurrence. So recurrence occurs between um, this area and re rises because we fail to seal that gap. Um, surgeries for primary pterygia create a gap between that area, and it's often overlooked, um, resulting in variable success rates. So let's look at a, a case here, just a very typical pterygium extending about uh, three to four millimeters onto the corneal surface, um, which is visually significant. We'll see if we can play this video here. The first thing we want to do is identify an area around the pterygium that we're planning on excising. Oftentimes, the pterygium will extend further anterior than we think. We want to identify areas is where we're going to recreate the semilunar fold, the area of excision, and then a two millimeter area where we're going to um, dissect away tenons so that we have a rim of normal overlapping conjunctiva. So we're going to actually pull the tenons forward um, and uh, then resect it so that it recesses itself. That way we have a gap here under normal tenons, or pardon me, under normal conjunctiva uh, under which we can tuck the amniotic membrane. So I start out anteriorly in most cases using a pifik blade or a crescent blade um, trying to dissect this off of Bowman's layer. About 90% of the time I'm successful in doing that and finding a normal tissue plane and then dissecting posteriorly. In this case, I'm just demonstrating a case where that did not happen and I simply start posteriorly and then avulse the pterygium from the cornea along that natural tissue plane. And you notice that I'm hardly doing any cutting except at the edges of this uh, lesion, but it's mostly a blunt dissection along that natural tissue plane. So now I've removed the pterygium, trying to just achieve hemostasis with minimal cautery. And if you find those natural tissue planes, you'll find that you do get minimal bleeding. And then I come back around along the entire periphery of this lesion to actually pull abnormal tenons forward from underneath the conjunctiva so that it recesses itself. And then I'm going to identify the gap for myself so that I can fold the amniotic membrane and tuck it into that area and then pinch it sealed with the fibrin thrombin glue, hence providing myself a sealed gap but without sutures. For recurrent cases, I would encourage you to use a suture uh, to seal that gap. I used to measure the membrane um, and cut it out, uh, but now I just sort of eyeball it having done these uh, far too many times, we're going to peel that off the uh, backing there, and it's the sticky stromal side that's against the paper backing, and that's the side that I want facing down against the bed. 
Um, if you ever lose your orientation, it's the sticky stromal side that will stick to a wet cell. Um, spear, the other side won't. I lay that over the, or the cornea and place minimal amounts of fibrin prom and glue. Uh, less is more in this case. The last thing you want is excessive uh, glue that's now stuck into that gap and actually tenting that gap open. When I lay the membrane down, I want to use minimal sort of squeegeeing action. There's a tendency to want to sweep from anterior to posterior, which is all it's doing is sweeping that glue into that gap, and that's going to increase your risk for recurrences. So I just sort of tuck it um, with minimal squeegee action here and then remove the excess glue so it's not tenting that gap open. Place the contact lens um, followed by a little subconjunctival uh, antibiotic and steroid. And what used to be a 20 to 30 minute case, very frustrating outcomes, uh, is now a very quick 10 minute case for me, very routine. Um, and these are some of the happiest patients I have. So let's uh, shift our attention now to uh, what is perhaps the most underappreciated ocular surface diagnosis we have today. Um, and is the source of great frustration for uh, any physician uh, who happens to see patients complaining of dry eye uh, complaints um, and certainly uh, of great frustration to patients who may be seeing a doctor who uh, fails to diagnose this. Conjunctival cholesis um, is certainly uh, simply a redundant conjunctiva and is actually a disease not of the conjunctiva but a disease of the underlying phenons um, and because of the dissolution of normal tenons under that conjunctiva as a result of chronic smoldering inflammation on the ocular surface, you get this redundant conjunctiva that billows or protrudes over the lower eyelid margin, um, thus obliterating the normal tear meniscus and tear film. It's important to note that more than 50% of the actual volume of tears on the entire ocular surface um, or in the eye, uh, actually resides in that fornix. And when you have that conjunctival cholesis and redundant conjunctiva in the fornix, it obliterates the natural reservoir for tears, which is going to exacerbate dry eye symptoms. And it's important that we identify the differences between aqueous tear deficiency and other forms of dry eye and dry eye symptoms caused by conjunctival cholesis. And it's a very clear distinction. Most of our patients with aqueous tear deficiency are going to notice that things are worse in the evenings as they've been using their eyes all day, whereas conjunctival cholesis patients will have fairly chronic smoldering symptoms all day long with no diurnal fluctuation. Aqueous tear deficiency dry eye patients are going to be worse in up gaze as this increases their exposure and the evaporative loss of tears, whereas conjunctival cholesis patients are going to be worse in down gaze as this forces more conjunctiva up and over the eyelid where they conceal it. The effect of vigorous blinking in an artificial uh, uh, aqueous tear deficiency dry eye patient is going to actually improve symptoms, uh, whereas in conjunctival cholesis, your patients are more likely to report that they just want to sit there with their eyes closed because blinking actually worsens the symptoms. It lets them feel every single one of those redundant wrinkles of conjunctiva. And conjunctival cholesis is actually frequently associated with recurrent subconjunctival hemorrhages, um, whereas this would be an uncommon finding in normal dry eyes. The fluorescein staining pattern is also a distinguishing feature. Tear meniscus interruption is pathognomonic for conjunctival cholesis, as we'll see in a moment, whereas in aqueous tear deficiency, you simply see a continuous but low tear meniscus or tear leg at the lower eyelid margin. In conjunctival cholesis, tear clearance or fluorescein clearance is frequently delayed since that meniscus is interrupted and the tears are actually not working their way over to the punctum uh, nasally. Rose Bengal or other vital staining patterns uh, are very frequent even in non-exposed areas, whereas in dry eye syndrome, typical dry eye syndrome, it's simply in the exposed area. Punctal occlusion and other forms of therapy for typical dry eye syndrome is going to be absolutely ineffectual for your conjunctival cholesis patients. And so if you ever find yourself wondering why a dry eye patient continues to complain of dry eye symptoms despite your best efforts at treating them, 
um, you really need to look for conjunctival cholasis and you will find your answer there. So looking at uh, the fluorescein staining pattern and a pattern of fluorescein um, resting in the tear meniscus, you can see here as labeled by the stars that there is a complete interruption of the normal tear meniscus in areas where the conjunctival cholasis obliterates it. And this also matches up to areas of intense conjunctivitis as well as blepharitis. Because those tears are not normally flowing towards the punctum for normal drainage, they're actually overflowing um, the eyelid margin and almost eroding the banks of uh, the river, so to speak. And it's going to cause a chronic um, blepharitis as well as a chronic uh, loss of a normal lid architecture. So obviously, as we said before, because these patients really have a mechanical issue, these patients really can't hold their own tears or seldom benefit from artificial tears, which they really can't hold on their eye. And so it's very easy to generate overflow. Restasis is certainly helpful in mainstream dry eye, as it does control ocular surface inflammation to some degree. Uh, but it takes an awfully long time to work, and it's simply working on the aqueous component of the tears. It has nothing to do with the mechanical issue. Uh, that's the root cause of uh, conjunctival cholasis and the symptoms thereof. So there's uh, the numerous uh, reports in the literature as to the mechanism by which conjunctival cholasis interferes with tear flow and thus leads to uh, dry eye syndrome. One of the uh, most elegant experiments uh, I've seen here and publications I've seen here is one that was provided for us by Dr. Singh uh, wherein he removed the normal tear meniscus and tear lake uh, using a capillary action with a pipette and watched the timing of the normal restoration of that tear lake. So normally the restoration is within seconds or fractions of a second in a normal eye. Um, or with blinking, a single blink will restore that tear lake uh, completely to normal levels. In patients with conjunctival cholasis, you can see that at zero seconds to eight seconds, there is no restoration of that normal tear meniscus. In patients without symptoms, there is some very slow restoration over eight to ten seconds. And in patients um, on the far right picture um, with uh, positive symptoms, uh, there's a very slow restoration um, and normalization after uh, amniotic membrane grafting. So removal of the conjunctiva, uh, conjunctival cholasis with um, placement of an amniotic membrane to reconstruct this normal tear reservoir will significantly improve the rate by which um, we restore our tear meniscus. So certainly patients will benefit from this um, even long term. Here is uh, a patient with a completely uh, obliterated uh, tear meniscus and tear lake um, with significant symptoms of the erosion of the normal architecture of the lid margin, chronic blepharitis, and conjuncti uh, conjunctivitis. Um, and even five years postoperatively in this patient of Dr. Sengs, um, we see that the tear meniscus is completely normalized and that chronic conjunctivitis is resolved. So let's move on to normal conjunctival lesions from benign lesions that we may see uh, quite commonly to pre-malignant and malignant lesions um, that we may see in our cornea clinics, macular surface disease clinics. Um, certainly benign lesions like nevi, papillomas uh, that are pedunculated or sessile, commonly associated with various strains of uh, HPV or human papillomavirus, dermoids and lipodermoids, pinguecula that may be raised and irritating to patients, and inclusion cysts that may arise from uh, trauma or contact lens patients and chronic smoldering inflammation. Um, these are all benign lesions that may result in uh, symptomatology for our patients and may require removal in the operating room. Certainly we have pre-lignant malignant lesions like primary acquired melanosis or PAM and CIN, conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia. Malignant lesions like melanoma, squamous cell carcinoma, Kaposi sarcoma, all of these things need to be removed with wide excision and adjunctive therapy um, that may affect our normal limbal stem cell health 
and um, uh, may slow down our healing process and our ability to heal uh, conjunctival wounds and uh, corneal wounds. So let's talk about a few cases here. This is a patient that presented with uh, diffuse primary acquired melanosis that was unresponsive and unchanged after three uh, spaced cycles of topical mitomycin, 0.2%. Uh, I usually do cycles of one week on, one week off, one week on, one week off, uh, for three cycles as such, um, and then scheduled for a wide excision uh, with placement of an amniotic membrane. Within three months, uh, you can see that we had no recurrences, no scarring, and uh, actually quite a, an excellent result in terms of cosmesis and, and patient comfort. Um, because of our use uh, both preoperatively and intraoperatively of mitomycin uh, over the entire bed and the periphery of the bed, um, so as to prevent recurrence, um, we were worried about the longevity of those lindal stem cells. But one of the benefits of cryopreserved amniotic membrane um, unique to biotissue is that it actually helps expand existing limbal stem cell populations. And so we've seen no problems with this patient, uh, either in terms of uh, corneal wound healing or uh, conjunctival healing. Here we have a patient with uh, conjunctival and corneal intraepithelial neoplasia. It may be hard to appreciate just how far over the cornea this lesion extends. You can see it outlining here, outlined here, uh, in, the, in the dotted line. So this lesion starts in the limbal conjunctiva and then extends over the cornea. Um, very useful to use rose pindol staining or other vital stains to identify the extent of this lesion. Um, and again, one month postoperatively after excision, uh, wide excision, um, epithelial uh, debridement with absolute alcohol, and amniograph placement over the conjunctiva and the cornea uh, resulted in uh, no recurrence and quite a clear cornea um, and normal conjunctiva without scar, giving this patient a, a nice clear visual axis again. And here we have a more aggressive ocular surface squamous neoplasia, um, more of a, a papillary type, um, where it extends uh, far posteriorly and indeed over the cornea uh, for a few millimeters. Um, one month after treatment with uh, interferon alpha 2b, an excision, wide excision with an amniotic uh, membrane graft, um, in a sutureless fashion, we were able to uh, remove most of the lesion and has not had any uh, areas of recurrence. One of the other areas where I often use amniotic membrane in the operating room rather than a prepare graft in clinic um, is. Uh, cases of filamentary keratitis, um, and oftentimes this is associated with um, superior limbic keratitis. Filamentary keratitis um, is often associated with chronic inflammation of the superior conjunctiva, and in some cases I, I actually consider this just a, a case of superior conjunctival chalasis, as it's thought to involve hyperemia and chalasis and microtrauma of the superior conjunctiva with resulting uh, keratitis symptoms. And so you get this very frustrating um, recurrent chronic filamentary keratitis that's painful to the patients. We should assess these patients for thyroid uh, disorders. And when we look at the old therapies, they're simply just not adequate. Um, they're painful to the patient, like silver nitrate drops. Um, you want to avoid using silver nitrate sticks. Um, debridement, bandage contact lenses, that's something that's just you're going to have the patient returning over and over again. Uh, with no real end in sight because you're not treating the underlying pathology. Um, certainly, mucomist or um, compounded N-acetylcysteine uh, available in a 10% solution from Leiter's Pharmacy and other compounded pharmacies is useful as a mucolytic, but again, it doesn't treat the underlying pathology. So we can often use an amniotic membrane uh, placement over the superior conjunctiva um, to resolve these symptoms very effectively. So um, in summary, we certainly have sort of a nice one-two punch for patients with ocular surface diseases. As Chris uh, started out with, we have a whole host of ocular surface diseases where uh, the Procara is immensely effective in being able to treat them, prevent scarring, prevent inflammation, um, and neovascularization. 
um, in office immediately at the point of diagnosis. And for the cases that perhaps require a trip to the operating room, we still, of course, have um, amiograph in our toolbox. Um, it's important to note that there are specific CPT codes for both amniograph placement and all its different forms, as well as for Procara that's specific uh, to the indications for Procara. So um, with that, I'm going to transfer over to uh, the group, and we're going to switch over to our question and answer session. So okay, we we have Dr. Wano again. I'm going to uh, answer just a couple questions that came in on the, I guess, the question and answer on the chats. One question asked to me was, do I use anesthetic when I remove the Procara ring? And the answer is yes, I usually do. I'll just put a drop of Proparacaine in, and it just makes it a little easier to remove the ring. People don't squeeze as much. So the answer is yes. It also makes it a little less traumatic, I think. And I guess the second question was, uh, when I'm using Procara with steroids, do I reduce the steroid frequency? And the answer is, yeah, I usually do. Because I think of the Procara as an anti-inflammatory. Oftentimes, they're not on much steroid anyway because uh, they have a poor healing epithelium, and I'm not thrilled with steroids decreasing that. Um, but if they're on steroids, I usually will you know, decrease it a little bit. Um, and oftentimes, they're not even on steroids at all at that point. Um, but I think steroids once or twice a day is reasonable, probably more than that, probably you don't need when, when you've got a Procara in. Now, one of the common indications that I find myself using Procara quite frequently is in preparing a patient for refractive cataract surgery, and they may have um, some basement membrane disorder or recurrent erosion syndrome. Um, and uh, I end up doing an in-office superficial keratectomy up a slit lamp um, which takes all of about 60 seconds to do, and I place a Procara. Um, whereas before, I used to just use a steroid taper um, and a bandage contact lens, really just for passive healing and for comfort. Um, but far too many cases were resulting in the sub-epithelial fibrosis and anterior stromal haze that ended up being visually significant. And ever since I started using Procara, I'm noticing that the inflammation and the healing is so quick and well-controlled um, that I no longer use a steroid taper. The Procara, um, in my experience, I would equate it to using um, prednisolone uh, about four times a day. And so where I might use prednisolone four times a day, um, but I don't want the effect of slower or delayed wound healing. Instead, I just use a Procara. Um, which provides me quite active wound healing as well as an anti-inflammatory um, effect. As Dr. Rapuano discussed, that dual action um, that's so unique to the Procara. Um, there were a couple other questions here. Um, I'll take the next one. Um, we had a question uh, that asked, do you use Procara after teresium surgery or just the graft and the amniograft product? Um, I haven't found it necessary to use Procara after uh, terrigium surgery. Um, the amniograft is usually quite effective. Um, where I do find myself using Procara after uh, a surgical indication is in high-risk corneal transplant patients, um, either after DSEC, uh, where I might debride all of the uh, edematous corneal epithelium, um, or after a high-risk uh, PKP patient, say uh, a patient with a neurotrophic cornea, poor, a history of poor wound healing, um, or, for instance, penetrating keratoplasty after a patient's had a history of herpetic keratitis, um, where I might expect there to be poor wound healing as well as a high risk of rejection. Um, and, I, and for those indications, I do use a Procara on postoperative day one um, in clinic. It's important to note that uh, you can be fully reimbursed with the, the provided CPT code um, doing this, as well as be fully reimbursed for your surgery if you include in your preoperative plan the placement of Procara post-op day one in clinic. And that way you get reimbursed um, at 100% for both um, parts of that procedure. But it must be part of your preoperative plan. Um, what's also interesting is I've used Procara after um, therapeutic transplants for infectious keratitis. Um, and in cases of infectious keratitis, primarily um, 
because it allows me to avoid this, this long age-old debate of do I use steroids and infectious keratitis to limit collateral damage or not because it might worsen the infection. Um, Procara sort of ends that debate uh, once and for all because we can now provide an anti-inflammatory effect and promote wound healing at the same time. And so we don't necessarily need to uh, introduce steroids right away. We can certainly do that later once we see uh, wound healing is, is occurring. Um, the second question here is, uh, have I used Procara for recurrent erosion syndrome and have I seen any recurrence afterwards? Um, well, no, I really haven't seen any recurrences. Again, for recurrent erosion syndrome associated with uh, basement membrane disease or mapped out fingerprint, um, what, what we found is that a superficial keratectomy along with the placement of the Procara is really going to inhibit all the matrix metalloproteases associated with um, recurrent erosion syndrome um, as well as the underlying basement membrane disorder. So you'll actually have a, a quite effective combination by doing superficial keratectomy in office um, followed by the Procara and you'll have excellent wound healing, um, prevention of recurrence and, and really no substromal or probably subepithelial haze. Dr. Rapalano, any comments on those questions? Nope, I am. I, I agree with that. Um, Are there any other questions from our our attendees? Let's see. Let me there. Let me see. There are a couple. I see a couple others here. Um, what's the expiration time for Procara? How long does it last in the freezer? You know, um, I don't know exact. I don't know the answer to that. But it's a long time, like a year. And if you have one that has expired, you can exchange it for a new one with, 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 from biotissue for no cost. I do know that. Um, but I do know they ask, last a long time. I don't know if someone from biotissue knows the exact answer from that to that question. Yeah, I, I would encourage everyone who is, is thinking about using this um, and making this part of your, your normal uh, toolbox or repertoire to have biotissue place a freezer where you can keep a small inventory of Procaras. If you have it, you would be able to use it. Um, you don't want to, at the point of diagnosis, have to wait to order it. Um, much better that you have it, and it lasts a whole year. You're going to end up using it. Um, and I started out using just you know one or two a month, and and at this point I'm using you know uh, about a dozen or two uh, per month at this point. Um, so I haven't run into any expiration date problems for that reason. Um, there's another question here. Have I had cases with severe inflammation resulting in melting of the amniotic membrane and Procare within a day or two? Um, and have I had patients who can't tolerate the Procare because of, because of its size? Um, well, let's, let's take this question in parts here. Um, the more inflammation that you have on the ocular surface, um, the faster the amniotic membrane is going to melt. Um, and what's really happening sort of on a molecular and cellular basis is the amniotic membrane is soaking up all of these inflammatory factors. And so you can actually look at staining patterns in the literature that have been published and actually see all the inflammatory cytokines that have been soaked up from the ocular surface and find them in the membrane um, that's been on the ocular surface. And so that's been when well documented. In cases where it does melt within a day or two, I'll take the symblephron ring out and oftentimes just replace it. Mind you, there is a 10-day global period. Um, so most of my patients will come back for a week follow-up. And if I deem it necessary to place another Procara because I'm looking at an empty ring and the membrane's melted, um, I'll simply replace the Procara after that um, yet again. Um, and uh, being mindful of the 10-day global period. And uh, I find that even after the membrane has dissolved, it's still released all of its active factors and molecules that, um, like PTX3 and, and other active molecules that are found in that cryopreserved membrane, um, and you'll have still a beneficial effect, even if it has melted rather quickly. I would add, I agree with that, I would add that um, if the eye is exposed at all, it tends to melt much more quickly. Um, so if patient's not blinking well, um, then it'll, 
it will it will definitely melt faster. And that's why I think the tape, um, like a tegaderm or just tape or the Breathe Right strips that are basically keeping, and usually I'll do a lateral tarsorophy and they can get the medications in nasally. Um, that's been very helpful to decrease the rapid melting. Yeah, I, um, I would encourage everyone for patient comfort uh, reasons to um, always use either a tape tarsorophy. I prefer a tagaderm tarsorophy um, where I simply cut a piece of tagaderm like an IV site covering in half and place it over the lateral um, upper and lower lid. Um, and I use tagaderm for a couple of reasons. One is it's sterile. It's very sticky, so it oftentimes lasts the full seven days. Um, it's clear and flexible, so it itself is comfortable for the patient um, and not going to be a source of irritation for the patient. It has some elasticity, so you can actually force um, so the lid closed um, with its stretchability there. And furthermore, from more of a, a PR standpoint, when I have done a Procara um, on a patient and they're walking back through my waiting room out to the front office and passing every single one of my prospective LASIK patients and refractive cataract surgery patients, I don't want them to have something that looks bulky and obtrusive on their eye. Um, and Tagaderm is, is a very clear and, and subtle way to accomplish um, our goals of, of lid closure. Um, and, and that's resolved all the patient comfort issues um, in my patient population. There's another um, question. Can Procaratrap debris due to its tight fit? Um, I, I, haven't had, uh, I haven't had a problem with that. I'm, I'm not sure, if, Neil, what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I haven't had any, any issues with that. Um, you know, what I find oftentimes is that the, the ring in its current form um, actually doesn't provide a very tight fit. In, in fact, it's actually a fairly loose-fitting uh, ring on the ocular surface, and it allows really good penetration of, of any drops that you might need, whether it's a steroid that you're using in combination or antibiotics that you're using in combination. Um, I haven't really found any debris uh, trapped under the membrane itself and had any problems with that. Um, there's a question about uh, our procedure for uh, treating conjunctival cholesis. Um, really, this is a fairly simple thing. Um, I start out at the limbus. I, I infiltrate with 2% lidocaine and epinephrine um, and use WEC cells to try and identify the extent of um, typically the lower area, the lower hemisphere of conjunctival cholesis. And I start uh, at the limbus and dissect posteriorly um, along the natural tissue planes. Um, by definition, you're going to have some very, very loose uh, sort of gelatinous penons or absent penons um, if you're doing this for conjunctival cholesis. It's important to, to identify your muscle again, and so using a traction suture uh, to flatten out that muscle would be important. Um, and then uh, you want to recreate that lower fornix. So um, before I layer my amniotic membrane down, I'll actually, again, suture that gap closed so that you deepen that fornix um, and you prevent fat prolapse. If you fail to do that um, and you fail to suture that uh, uh, lower junction of the fornix um, and recreate your fornix, um, you're going to end up with long-term fat prolapse and a foreshortening of the fornix, and, and that will just exacerbate your symptoms. Um, so it's important to, to recreate and reconstruct the fornix by suturing uh, the conjunctiva um, and penons and, and closing that gap again. Um, and then I just, I, I use uh, Tisseal to glue down the amniotic membrane. Um, in most cases, this is uh, a very uh, simple, straightforward, 10-minute type case um, with just really excellent patient satisfaction. It's been a, a real um, boon for my patients ever since I started actually looking for it and, and trying to treat it. Dr. Rappelani, does your, your technique differ from that at all for conjugalasis? I've done, I've done it, you know, numerous ways over the years. Um, and, you know, you can do – I've done it various ways, and I think that's a very reasonable way to do it. I think we have one last uh, kind of part two of a question here. Have we had patients that can't tolerate the Procare because of its size or whatever, and what did we do? Um, I have had rare patients that you put it in and, you know, it's a little uncomfortable, 
in the in the chair. So oh, you know, you'll get used to it. And then they they leave and they come back a half hour later, an hour later, saying, "Oh my God, it's just too uncomfortable." And you know, no matter what we do, we haven't been able to get them to tolerate it, and we'll just remove it and uh, and go on to a different treatment. Sometimes we'll actually bring them to the operating room and suture uh, or glue, suture slash glue, an AMT on there. But I have had rare patients that uh, that the prokaryotes isn't comfortable enough. But you know, for the bulk of it, um, they're rather few and far between. It's rather it's rather well tolerated for the most part. I'd agree with that absolutely. Um, you know, I used to selectively uh, patch or sort of do the tagoderm tarsorophy on only select patients. Um, and ever since I just did it universally on every single one. And I, I think it, it bears being said that, you know, before you do it, um, counseling the patient and having them expect it to be somewhat bulky and uncomfortable and letting them know what the benefits of this are in terms of uh, better healing and less scar tissue um, will help them kind of realize the benefits and, and be invested in it. And most of them will make it through the first 24 hours, um, you know, with a, a little oral pain medication like Tylenol. Um, and uh, they get through that 24 hours, and, and that's really the tough part. Um, they get past that 24 hours, they actually do quite well, and, and they get used to it. Um, in the rare cases where I've had a patient come back to me uh, 24 hours later and they just really can't tolerate it, oftentimes these are uh, patients with smaller eyes um, where their fornix to fornix uh, dimensions are, are a bit narrow. Um, I've even noticed that Procara did still help them heal faster than I would have expected, even though it was only in for 24 hours, um, because you still have the action of those um, molecular um, factors that are active in the Procara that are being released, and you may still see some benefit, but you can always transition to an alternative therapy um, uh, if it's completely intolerable. But that, that happens very rarely in my practice as well. Do we have uh, one last question here at all? Question with that? I think we may have gotten them all. Um, excellent. I think we may have caught all the questions here. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for attending, and uh, I w if any questions come up, uh, I'm certainly available by email, um, and uh, your local reps can uh, put you in touch with Dr. Rapolano or I if other questions come up uh, as you start um, venturing into the world of biologics. Thanks again for attending.